Listeners, my name is Shannon Cooney from Merrick Property Group Real Estate Agency and a very proud sponsor of the Paracave podcast. If you own a property in the Penrith LGA or Lower Blue Mountains and would like to know what it's worth in today's market, give me a call on 0421 588 Broadcasting live from the Paracave. Hello and welcome to another bumper episode of the Paracave podcast. My name is Troy Warner and I'll be your host this week and every week. And today is episode 105 and we are going back to the Parramatta Eels and celebrating players, people, fans and members of the Eels from over the last 75 years. And today's chat, well, whilst he has played for the Eels, he is well known as a grand final try scorer off one of the most famous passes in a grand final in history. And well, I think you may know who I'm talking about now, and that is, of course, Mr. Pat Richards. Now, during the chat, we talk about early rugby league memories, including favourite team and players, making his first grade debut at the Eels, and also playing at the Eels, joining the West Tigers and those early injury setbacks. The, Of course, we talk about the 2005 Grand Final and that try from that magical Benji Marshall flick pass. Uh, After the Tigers, he headed over to England where we talk about his time playing for the Glamour Club, the Wigan Warriors, and also coming back again to the NRL and playing at the West Tigers. The personality, set of six questions, and much, much more. So, so much to get through and to listen to, all brought to you by a major sponsor, Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Parramatta Leagues Club in the club shop. And later on in the podcast, I'll give you some information on how you could win a new car, a Subaru Impreza, with a competition that that Para Leagues is running. So stay tuned for that one. Also, a shout out to co-sponsors Shannon Cooney from the Merrick Property Group and the Stubby Club. And listeners, Father's Day is coming up. It is right around the corner So for the best present for Dad, the Stubby Club has a huge range of sports, merch and gifts to choose from. Head to thestubbyclub.com.au and remember to use Paracave at checkout for a 10% discount. Thank you to all the sponsors. With your support, it helps the podcast grow and reach more people, which is much, much appreciated. But... Enough of me talking, let's get into the chat with Pat and have a listen to his rugby league story. So as Hindy says... Get a beer, coffee, whatever you want. Sit back, relax and enjoy and let's get straight into it. It's Pat Richards here, former Parramatta Eel, West Tigers, Wigan Warriors and Catalan Dragons player. I'm about to have a, a chat with Troy on the Paracave podcast. Right foot kick, down the ground, into the end goal almost. Hodgson cuts it off. Hodgson taken by Norton. He took him late. Marshall skips away. Marshall skips away. Marshall's still going. Marshall's got Richards coming up outside. Now inside. Richards pursued. He pushes Jensen away. Pat Richards. Pat Richards has scored. A magnificent try. Link to the field stuff. Oh, that is one of the great grand final tries. And as you heard from his intro, my guest today on the Paracave podcast is a former professional rugby league player at the West Tigers and the club I love, the Parramatta Eels in the NRL, but also the Wigan Warriors and the Catalan Dragons in the English Super League, but also represented Ireland in two World Cups, also won the Men of Steel Award in England in 2010, 
and also scored one of history's most recognised and iconic grand final tries in 2005 in the West Tigers win versus the Cowboys. A player I watched play his whole career and also played at the club I love, the Parramatta Eels, and with it being the 75th year anniversary of the Eels in the competition, why not get another eel on for a chat? So welcome to the Paracave podcast, Eels player 619, Mr Pat Richards. Hello, right, Troy. How are you, mate? Not too bad. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, whereabouts did you grow up and what was your childhood like growing up? Mate, I grew up in Ashcroft, um, southwest of Sydney. Um, my parents are Irish. So they they were they moved to Australia when they were about 20. My, my sister was born in Dublin and uh, me and my brother were born uh, in Australia. I was yep. born at Liverpool, Liverpool Hospital and... Um, Mate, my upbringing was um, yeah, we we didn't have a lot of money back then, but we had we had enough, and, and you know my my childhood is basically just playing cricket out the back of my brother, um, bit of footy, but I was always doing something, you know. I just love yeah. sport, and uh, that's when I look back at my childhood, it's it's f- filled with sport and uh, good times. Now you were quite a uh, accomplished cricketer, along with playing rugby league as a junior for the. Cabramatta 2 Blues, if I'm not mistaken, the same club as Junior Paolo, the current Eels front rower. Was it difficult? Was it a difficult decision to choose which sport you wanted to play? Um, I suppose like like any sport, you, you grow up, you just want to have fun. And I was lucky enough that I was I was sort of playing heaps of sports and, and cricket um, during the summer and rugby league in the winter. And I suppose it, di- it did come to a stage where I thought. And probably happened a bit quicker than I thought. I was playing, I was playing, ended up playing first grade cricket for Fairford Liverpool, and and then uh, the next off season, Brian Smith sort of called me into the um, sort of the full time squad with the with the junior junior reels as well. Yep. So we would we'd go in and train with the juniors junior. It was a Jets program back then, so we had a really good young kids back then, Danny Sullivan and Jamie Lyon and Danny Irvine and those sort of guys, yep. and we're coming through together and. Um, and then it basically, I had to just sort of decide if that was if that was what I wanted to do, and, and then cricket sort of I had to stop it from from that moment, which is a shame because I love cricket, but um, definitely no regrets because I've uh, absolutely loved my time playing footy, and it's given me um, it's given me a great life. Yeah, definitely. Well, you did stick with rugby league, and what is your earliest rugby league memory? Um, earliest rugby league memories, obviously, watching on TV. I remember grand final day was massive. You'd yeah. always be at someone's house um, having a barbecue or whatever, and, and then everyone watched watched the, the, the game, and it was always a massive occasion. And um, you know, and then I was watching my brother play. My brother played footy, and, and I always wanted to play, so I played soccer from when I was sort of four years old um, until I was twelve. Yep. Mum, mum wouldn't let me play. She said it was a bit rough. She said as soon as you get to high school, I'll let you play. And um, basically. My first day at high school, um, I bumped into Danny Sullivan and ended up playing first grade at Parramatta. Yep. And uh, the very first day, he said, mate, come to training tonight. Come to training for Cabra. And uh, basically under 12s was my first first year. And then I got home and I said, mum, you said as soon as I get to high school, I can play footy. <laughs> and uh, she said, all right, no worries. Um, and then the rest is history. Uh, Norris, was there a team that you followed in the, in, in the early days there? Mate, I probably wasn't the greatest supporter, to be honest. Um, I, I literally went for everyone who was winning. Okay, yeah, no, that's fair <laughs> so, enough. So through the 90s, uh, Brisbane was um, doing really well. and Yeah, I remember watching them and loved Alfie Langer. And I just used to flow it. But it wasn't until sort of like I played a bit of junior junior reps under 12s, 13s at Parramatta that I sort of stuck with the Eels there for, um, yeah, I started going for the Eels then. Who were some of the players that you used to love watching play and maybe you wanted to play like? Um, oh, one of my favourites would, would have been Eric Groth Sr. Yep. Um, he, he was an absolute legend and just still remember that try, I think it was against the Bulldogs where he beat about, you know, seven blokes. He was just so hard to stop and oh, yeah. there wasn't really a winger like him back then, was there? Um, so he he was unreal. But that, that Parramatta era of those those sides, Sterling and Kenny and, and Price, geez, they were, they were awesome. Um but yeah, also and then growing up, probably a bit of Brad Fittler, Andrew Johns, those yeah. sort of guys as well. And, and like I said earlier, Alfie Langer, I did love Alf. Yeah, no, champion players, all of those. And probably Eric Senior was probably the first sort of prototype for the 
the big wingers that you see these days, wasn't he? Absolutely, yeah. Just the way he used to carry the footy, um, you know, it was, was was unreal. It was like a forward. Now, now look at the wingers these days. They're, they're well over 110 kilos, some of them. So it's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Well, you make your way through the grades at Parramatta, uh, and then eventually your first grade debut was against the Storm off the bench at Parra Stadium. What was your debut like, and was first grade everything you thought it was going to be like? Yeah, so I come off the bench. It was unlimited interchange back then. Um, so I basically I started off the bench. And I still remember standing on the sideline. It was probably about five minutes before half time, and I was thinking I'm actually going to run on uh, to Paramount Stadium and, and be become an NRL player and, and play. Like it's Stephen Kearney was I still remember looking and going. I'm actually on the same field as Stephen Kearney. Like, yeah. Um, and it was amazing. And literally, after five minutes, I've never been more tired in my life. It was like I, I literally didn't take a breath. I was running around like a headless chook because um, you just the game's a lot faster, but you're also just so excited. Yeah. Um, so I got back in at half time, settled down, and ended up having a win that night. And um, yeah, it was just it was just an awesome experience to have my family there, and I could finally live a dream where you didn't think it was going to happen. Like I was only 18 at that stage, so. Um, they're one year out of school and playing NRL, which is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, being 18, you had the experienced guys like Jim Jimmy, Gary Larson, Dean Schifoletti, Jason Smith, and also this week's guest, uh, Dallas Weston. Was it those sort of guys that took you under their wings, being the young guy in the team? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you could say all of those guys um, were, were there. And even the, the younger guys who played a couple of years, like the Hindmarsh brothers and, and the Kalis brothers, Andrew Ryan was still there. Like, we had some really good guys there. Yeah. Um, Brian Smith was an awesome coach and he loved bringing kids through the system. Um, so, so looking up to those guys like Gary Larson and, and those sort of fellas. Jim Dimmick, I really love playing with Jim. Yeah. Um, he uh, just had so much skill and just... You know, I think I think I still had a poster up my wall from from him. You know, so at the same time, so it was a bit it was a bit of a bit of a cool experience. Yeah, nice. Well, yeah, in two thousand and one, you played ten games, but unfortunately missed the grand final versus Newcastle. How disappointing was that for you to miss the big one? Yeah, well, I, when I when I debuted in two thousand, I, I played the the last sort of it was ten games or maybe 14 games, I think it was. Um, and then I started 2001, and I was, we're doing okay. And I uh, played the first 10 games. Then I'd done my knee really bad against the Bulldogs. Um, so I was out for 12 months, and the boys just went on a massive run um, in 2001. I was playing some great footy, so it was, it was tough to sit back and watch. It was also awesome to see, because yep. I think they scored, still the hold the record for most points in a season, that, that side. Um so it was unfortunate the boys couldn't get the couldn't get the grand final win um, against the Knights, but yeah, I was I was disappointed. I, I, my season was cut short for sure. With the, uh, do you think you would have made the grand final team having started those first ten games in the season at, in two thousand and one? Because there was a lot of competition for spots. There was, yeah, we had some unreal wingers, um, you know, Luke Burt, Scotty Donald, and. And those sort of guys. Um, so it was it was definitely, you know, I would have loved to have been in in the conversation for sure. But you never you never know, dear, um, how things play pan out. Um, so um, it was unfortunate the injury was there. I was out for a full twelve months, but it, it took me a good couple of years to get over that injury. It's probably probably what led me to leave the club in the end. Yeah, no, it was um, not a very good start. As you said, because of the injuries, uh, was it true that Brian Smith said maybe focus on your cricket career because you were unwanted at Parramatta after two thousand and three? Oh, the, the story goes a bit like that. It's not really the case. Yeah. Um, sort of the last year when I, when I was sort of looking when I was off contract, uh, Smithy did get me in. Um, he looked. He just said sort of because I was coming off that injury in a couple of years it was it was tough to get going again. Um, it was one thing after the other. So the knee, I'd have to get another clean out. I just couldn't get my leg right. And, um, he, he did offer me like a small term, sort of just a one year sort of thing. Okay. Um, but I just didn't feel like, I don't know, I felt like I just needed to change. It wasn't about anything else. I, I did love my time at the Eels. Um, I had a meeting with Tim Sheens as well. And I suppose that just the way he spoke about the game and, and what he was talking about and he, things he saw in my game, I just felt a bit more confident just in a, and I needed a fresh change that 
uh, that's why I decided to go to the Tigers. Well, you went to the Tigers, and it was a disappointing start for yourself, unfortunately, because, again, another uh, ankle injury in a pre-season trial. Just how tough was that for you mentally? Did you think, what's going on here with all these injuries? Mate, absolutely, I did. I was thinking, I can't take a trick here. Um, had a couple of lean years of the Eels, getting injured, um, one thing after the other. Then I'll we'll go for a fresh start. And I had an unbelievable sort of pre-season um, at the Tigers, and... We actually played. We actually played in the sevens before the before the season oh, started. Yeah. We ended up we ended up winning the sevens. We played against Parramatta in the final, actually. <laughs> um, so so I was actually I was actually starting to feel really good. And then in the trial match, like a week or two after the sevens, dislocated my ankle, and I was out for another five months. And I was thinking, what have I done? What you know, I've, I've done something wrong to someone because I keep getting bad luck. But that's how the regular league is. It's just uh, sometimes you get injured and it's just it's bad how you deal with it. So I think those lessons have taught me a lot about recovery and, and being professional with treating my injury with respect. And, and I really learned how to manage my body going forward. So you could have looked at it either way, but I, I looked at it as a positive because it set me up for the rest of my career. We see it now, unfortunately, with uh, Ryan Pappenhausen went down yesterday. He's had a few injuries um this season so hopefully yeah, it's, he it's tough and I, I yeah. feel I feel for both of that when they have one after the other and Tommy Turbo as well and when I was at the Tigers James Tedesco was a young kid and he had some really bad luck as well and I remember I remember telling him I said mate you'll get through it just stick at it then there'll be you, you'll think of you can't remember the last time you're injured and look at Teddy go now he's, yeah. he's probably had probably had six seasons now where he hasn't really had an injury like touch wood um you just get on a bit of a roll then yeah, definitely champion player, New South Wales captain, and potentially uh, the next Australian captain. Um, what was it like playing Parramatta for the first time uh, in the regular competition? Because you beat them eighteen two. Was it was it bittersweet? When was that? When I was at the Tigers. Yeah, at the Tigers. Yeah, when you played. Yeah, the, yeah, it was it was bittersweet. You know, because I did. I still had a lot of friends at the club, and obviously it's my first club you know i hold hold the year i love the eels you know it's, i've still got my debut jersey up in my garage um oh, so nice. so yeah a lot of a lot of fond memories of uh, my time at the club so yeah it's always tough when you when you do play against your old club you do you do want to put one over your mates as well but um yeah I, you, you definitely there's a lot of respect there for for the Parramatta club was there any like uh friendly face rubs into the ground or anything like that from from some of your former teammates Mate, I think yeah. Well, there was from Nathan Kalis. Oh, uh, really? He, 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 no, no. He um he got me. He called me around the around the around the chin. So a bit of a bit of a concussion there. So thanks for that, Kalo. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's that's his regular, isn't it? Yeah. He's a he's a he's a champion guy, and he's actually working at the Tigers at the moment as assistant coach. So, um, you know, it was yeah, it was nothing nothing untoward from from Kalis. He's the nicest bloke in the world. So oh, um, yeah, it's just just awesome to to play against those boys and. Um, they obviously had amazing careers as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, the Tigers finished ninth in 2004, uh, and then 2005, it was a bit of a strange start to the season. You lose the first game, win the next three, lose the next four, win the two, lose two, um, and then you go on a run. What do you think was the moment or turning point, do you think, that made the Tigers go on that run? So we're a bit inconsistent, like you said, but that's you get that when you have a young side. We had we had young guys in, in young like key positions. You know, Robbie Farrow was probably in his first year of first grade, and Benji Marshall was playing five eight. So you're going to get a bit of inconsistency out of our out of our game. Um, it's probably halfway through the year that at the start of the year we said we we had a goal of top four. Um, everyone wanted to go top four, and then halfway through the year, Tim Sheen sat us down and said, "Boys." I think we should reevaluate where we're at, and and the boys sort of got their backs up a little bit and said, no, we're still a chance. And Benny Galea stood up and, and challenged Sheenzy and everyone else in the team that we we said that that was our goal at the start of the year, and and that's that's what we're going to get. And everyone just lifted. Then we trained a bit harder and focused a bit more and came together. And then um, and then we went on a bit of a run. You know, we beat we beat the Dragons at Cogra, and that started off a, an eight game winning run and. Yep. Um, yeah, it was just unbelievable momentum that we created going into that playoffs, and then we we end up being top four. We finished in the top four, 
and then uh, and then the rest is history. We won we won four in the playoffs and won the grand final. What was your favourite moment during that run? It was it was against uh, we played Shark Cronulla at Shark Park it's a Sunday afternoon. You've probably seen the trial where Benji does that oh, yeah. big three the step step step. But the way we played footy that day was just it was so so much fun um, being out there. We we scored about four or five tries from our own half. Um, so we, we're a side that loved to throw the ball around and back our skill, and uh, and it really came out that day. And um, yeah, it was just amazing to be on the back in the end of that back line um, when those boys are just doing what they're doing. Oh, definitely, there's some great tries scored uh, in that game and and around that time. The finals came around, and as you said, the Tigers finished fourth and. You play the Cowboys, you beat them fifty to six. Then you beat the Broncos, and then you play the Dragons in the prelim. The, the Dragons were favourites, and probably most people thought they were going to win. But what was that moment like for you when that full time hooter went, and knowing that you're going to be into the grand final? Yeah, it was a bit, a bit of a crazy feeling because going into that game, and even even the semi, the other semi, Parramatta were were massive favourites against the Cowboys. Um, and they lost. I think it was twenty nine nil. Um, we were we were really confident. Dragons had a like they had all the stars in that side. You know, Gaznia, Barrett, Riles, and, and all those guys. Um, but we were just confident. We were just so so confident in our own ability. Um, I, I again with my bad luck of injury, I, I ended up doing my ankle um, just before half time. So I thought, oh, my season's over. So you asked me about my feeling after the game. Well, yeah. it was a bit bittersweet because I thought I'm going to miss another grand final through injury. Um, but luckily enough, I end up making the, making the field come come grand final night. I, I'm only guessing it was probably a little bit intense for yourself, like trying to get onto that field that week leading up to the game in the grand final. Oh, it def- definitely was, but but also it was a it was a big distraction in you know in itself because I didn't I didn't have to worry about the the fan days and all that. I was just in the physio room, just trying yeah. to ice my leg and get everything right. And, um, and by the time captain's run came around, I was, I was, you know, had a few needles in the ankle and, and luckily got through that. So I didn't really have any of the other things that players get nervous about. I was just so excited that I was actually going to go out there with the rest of the boys and compete in the grand final. Yeah, definitely. Well, it was played in front of 84,500 people. Um, what was that moment like running out in front of all those crowd? That crowd. Um, oh, it was amazing. You know, your, your dream of those days. I spoke earlier about being a kid, being around barbecues and watching Grand Final Day and seeing how big it is, and um, to run out and to hear that roar of the crowd and to know it's it's such a special moment. You know, you know, like all the special things, like even the the try lines, is, they make it just a bit bigger, don't they, on Grand Final yeah, Night? Yeah, definitely. Um, it just yeah, it had all that about it, and you know, standing arm in arm when they do the national anthem, it's it's quite a special feeling, and I still remember it to this day, and it gives you the hairs on the back of the neck stand up. Yeah, for sure, it's a great day, grand final day, and great day for yourself. As you, as I said in the intro, you score one of the most recognisable tries in grand final history, courtesy of a. Benji Marshall flick pass and your palm on Rod Jensen. Just take myself and the listeners through that try because, as I said, it was one of the great grand final tries. Yeah, well, that's that's right. I mean, it still gets played to this day, and it's quite amazing that it, it's still it hasn't hasn't sort of died off um, how much it gets played. You know, because um, yeah, but but I'm also aware that it could have gone the other way. It could have been could have been known as the Rod Jensen tackle. Yeah, if you got me out, you know yeah. what I mean, like like yeah. the Scott Sattler one a few years before. Um, so going back, um, Benji was actually in my position um, to field the kick. He had some really bad shoulders back then. Um, I had obviously the injury, so I was defending in the centres, and he would go back to do the kick returns. Um, now, just a lot of things happen. So when Thurston kicks the ball, Anthony Lefranchi sort of takes him out. So. Nowadays, they might have even gone back and had a look at that and okay. ruled the try out. Yeah. But um, it was amazing. And then someone else, I think it was Travis Norton, tried to take Hodge out. So there was a little gap. Benji Benji's jumps through, explodes through that. And then he sees Matty Bowen. He's running out of touch. And he just decides to do this unbelievable flick pass, which which is incredible to try on a big stage like that. But that's how, that's how Benji played back then. And that's how the Tigers played back then. We just tried things and... And uh, we trained like that and and in big moments like that, that's when it came out. And it's lucky enough to stick the right hand out that the ball stuck. 
and then I seen Rod Jensen come over. I thought he's going to throw me into the grandstand, but <laughs> yeah. I, I just I got that fend out and I just just hit him on the button and and the way he went and luckily enough it jumped over for the try. So it was incredible to be in a special moment like that that still gets played today. Is that your favourite ever try, or is there one that stands out that you know you just love that try because it won a game or anything, or it doesn't come close? Um, oh, look, there's there's probably better oh, there's probably better tries, but in the biggest moment like that, that's the most recognisable one for sure um, that people still remember. Like a lot of people don't remember a lot from certain games; they remember one or two key moments, and that's definitely one that that always gets talked about. And, People always tell me where they were when that try was on, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't get sick of talking about it because, like no, I said, it could have, could have been, could have been the other way, and um, could have been, could have been a bad moment for us, but it was awesome. Yeah, for sure. Well, news just recently that uh, Tim Sheens is going to take over as head coach of the Tigers for the next two years, and then uh, Benji Marshall and uh, is going to become the head coach, and then Robbie Farrow is going to be his assistant. When Tim takes over, do you think um, he'll coach the same sort of style as what he did back with you in the Tigers back in that day? Or do you think because the game's changed so much, they won't be able to do it that way? Um, oh, definitely the game's changed. Like the, the Certain plays wouldn't work now because of defensive lines and defensive systems. But um, you def- he's definitely smart enough and he's evolved over time. Like he was doing things with, with that Canberra side that probably wouldn't have worked, you know, in 2005. So he's definitely evolved. Yeah. Um, and he's got, he's got Benji and Robbie there to, to help him out. So that they'll all know how they want to play, but you've also got to get the best out of that team they're going to have. So to, it doesn't matter how you want to play. If, you know, certain coaches like Trent Robinson came over to the Tigers. Now we're not going to play like the Roosters played. You've got to, You've got different players, yeah. so you've got, to, you've got to find out the best way that each individual can play and, and go to their strengths. So, yeah, I'm excited about the challenge and the change, and in in, uh, I think it's going to be good for the club. Could you ever see Benji and, and Robbie becoming coaches after f- playing footy? Um, yeah, I could. Yeah, I could. They, um, they definitely know a lot about the game. Um, they, they do love the club. They're great people, persons. Um, Mate, that ticks a lot of boxes for being a coach. Obviously, they don't have that experience about, you know, week in, week out being a coach, but they, they know the game better than anyone and they know the club better than anyone. So they've got, they've got Tim Sheen, who's got 40 odd years' experience to help them out there as well. Um, but it's not going to be an overnight success. So, um, but I think, I think they'll, be, they'll be good coaches. That's, yeah. Are you involved in any way at the Tigers these days? Yes, yeah, so I'm involved with the West Tigers Foundation as an okay. ambassador. Yep. Um, so I go. I was, I was at the game yesterday, and, and I'll do little promotions here and there for the club. Um, still great to be involved in the club yep. on a part-time basis, but um, I don't think I'd want to do the full-time coaching. Um, it's not probably for me. I think certain types of people would want that, but it's more of a lifestyle thing where it's a lot of hours, it's a lot of video cutting. It's yeah, it's, certain people love it, but not for me. Yeah, no worries. Not even on a, a part-time basis if Benji or, or Robbie come calling for maybe a kicking oh, coach or something like that? Yeah, part-time stuff would, would suit me. Um, so we'll see. See what happens. Yeah, that's it. Um, it must have been hard to leave the Tigers uh, after 2005 winning the comp, heading over to England to play for Wigan, even though you saw one for Wigan before the grand final. Yeah, it was it was tough, but the reason why I did sign was like I think we spoke about before about the amount of injuries I had, and I thought if I don't take this opportunity, I probably won't get it again. Yeah. Um, so that's the reason why I did go, but I didn't think I'd go for as long as I did. I thought I'd go for two years, come back, but end up being eight years, and I absolutely loved my time over there. And um, but I was just yeah, I'm glad I did come back to the club. Was it? Uh, did it make it easier having a few Australians in the team? Um, yeah, Wigan? obviously, obviously, trying to settle in, it did. Um, but it was a tough sort of start, you know. Like in two thousand and five, we won the grand final, and then I went over there a bit late. I had a couple of surgeries because because of, of my injuries in the grand final, and I um I got there late, and then the season started early. The, the side wasn't doing too well, so it took it took a bit of time to get going over there. Um, but yeah, like like I just love my time there. Both my kids end up being born over there, and. Eight, eight great years, meetings and great people. 
And you got to play with uh, one Brian Fletcher. What was Fletch like to ha- play and hang around with? Mate, he, he, Fletch is uh, hilarious. He's exactly like he is on all those shows that you see. Yeah. He just does not – some people put their put their TV voice on and they talk a certain way. Fletch is like that 24-7. He's just uh, – <laughs> he's a great teammate. Um, he's so much fun and, yeah, had some really good times with him. Yeah, for sure. It'd be great to have at a barbecue or something like that. Well, 2010 is no doubt a special year for yourself as Wigan win the grand final and yourself won the Man of Steel Award, a pretty prestigious award. And for those that don't know, it's like winning the Dally M Player of the Year in the NRL, but over in England. How high does winning that rank on the list of your achievements? Um, Yeah, I mean, it was very special. Um, very special year and to win that award sort of capped it off um, you know I'll probably put put win in the grand final above that um, over there because yep. uh, if you win you win that award it doesn't you know it means means a lot to yourself but it's a team sport you know you can't you can't win awards like that if you haven't got a, a team which which you know helps you out and you know I was in a really good side um, over there and uh, we're lucky enough that I won the award, then five days later I, I end up winning the grand final with that same team. So it capped off a really good year. Um, and it's something I can look back on and, and be proud of. Um, it's probably my best year I've ever played footy in 2010. My body, body was in really good nick. I was 28 years old and, um, yeah, I was in a good side. So things were going well. I was goal kicking, was hitting them pretty well. And, yeah, it was... Um, it was a good time. And the coach of that team was Michael Maguire. The, he recently left the Tigers after a few hard years there. How did you find Michael as a coach? Because some say he had some hard training techniques and the like. Yeah, he did. He did have some hard training techniques. But, um, you know, the game's hard. So you do have to train that way. And um, I love my time under Madge. He was um, he was awesome for the club, awesome for myself. And, yeah, really good coach and... You know, he turned us around over there. We were, we were a side that finished sixth three years in a row. Then he turns up and we win the comp. And, and ever since then, the, the, he's turned that club around. They've, they've been competing for trophies and, and whatnot every year since. So um, he's a really good coach and yep. um, I love my time under him. And 2014, you come back to the Tigers for a couple of seasons. Did you feel like you had some unfinished business in the NRL or you wanted to challenge yourself again in the NRL? Yeah, a bit of both, a bit of, both, a bit of unfinished business. I did leave the NRL at 23 years old. Um, I only thought I'd go for two years, but like I said, I went for eight in the end. And um, But I did have a burning desire to come back and compete. And when I did come back, I was sort of 20, I was 32. Yep. Um, and I, was, I just wanted to come back and have a crack back here and, I'm glad I did because I really enjoyed those those couple of years with the Tigers. Um, some good young kids at the club at the time, and um, yeah, just had some had some good moments. Well, one of those uh, young kids is Luke Brooks, who's still there at the Tigers, and there's been a lot of commentary about Luke. Maybe he should have a change of club uh, for a fresh start. Do you think that is right, or do you think it is unfair criticism on, on Luke? Oh, look. Everyone criticises everyone these days. You know, you can't escape it in the NRL. Fortunately, everyone's got an opinion, um, but he can only do what he can do. So I'm not sure if he's going to be at the club. I hope he is um, because I think he's still got a lot of good footy in him. Um, But, yeah, it's not really my call about what what happens there. Um, I hope he stays at the club and he, he, uh, he helps the club, you know, get out of where we're at at the moment. Yeah, well, let's hope Team Sheens can uh, work his magic with with Luke. It'd be great to see him succeed at the Tigers because he's been there for a while. And, um, yeah, he's a halfback there at the moment. So it'd be good to see if he can get back to those uh, good days that he was having. He was Dally M halfback of the year a couple of years ago. So, yep. Now, your career wasn't over after the Tigers stint because then you go back over to, uh, well, France this time, play for the Catalan Dragons in the English Super League. Was there one more fire in the belly to play over there or how did that come about? Um, look, I, I, looking back, I, my body was pretty much cooked at that stage. My knees weren't great. Um, but, I, look, I had an opportunity to go over there and um, I just got a got a call from my manager one day and said, hey, would you, how do you feel about going to the south of France for for uh, two years or 12 months? And I said, far out. You know, <laughs> I thought, I'll come back. I've done the whole travelling thing and 
um, I said to my missus, um, you know, what are, you, what are your thoughts? And we're like, oh, no. But then, uh, look, we've always been those types of people where you look at opportunities and um, it was an outstanding opportunity to go go over there. The kids were still young at that stage and um, we, we took it. Um, it didn't work out sort of how I wanted it, but I ended up playing about 20 games and then my knee was just gone. It was just swelling every, every day and yeah. just couldn't get going over there. So um, ended up finishing a bit early and getting back. But, yeah. I think uh, I look back on my career now and I don't have any regrets about, you know, I wish I played a bit longer because I know that I, I definitely got the most out of my body. How's your knowledge of the French language? Was it difficult playing in a non-English speaking team? Um, yeah, that, that was part of the challenge, you know. It's exciting yep. to go over there. And even my kids, my kids went to school in France. Um, they've been to school in three different countries now because they oh, started wow. in England. England, you know, they've been in Australia, then also in France. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, our coach was French, Laurent Frazenus was his name, and he used to speak to the boys in French to start with, and then he would talk in English, and, and we could start to work out, you know, certain words and things okay, like that, and yeah. you could understand it more than you could speak it. Um, so yeah, that was, that, was, that was awesome, and a lot of the French guys were awesome as well. You know, they would help us out with certain things and teach us certain things. So yeah, just a great experience. Nice. Now, uh, before your career ended, did you have a, a plan in place for what you wanted to maybe do after after playing? And how did you find that transition into normal everyday life? Yeah, I think like every player, you want to, everyone wants to stay involved with the game because the game was such a big part of their lives. Um, I thought I was going to do do that, but I just had an, I had an opportunity when I got back to, to do something totally different. I bumped into a guy I played against over there in, in England and played for Ireland with Shane McManamy and okay. yeah. he was doing something in sales and he said, do you want to, you want to have a chat to his boss at the time? And I did. And then one thing led to the other and, um, I got, I got the job as I'm in sales now, I sell machinery and, um, and I've been doing it since I retired, yeah. um, come up, coming up to six years now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, you mentioned Ireland there, and we see at the end of this year the rescheduling of the World Cup in England, and you played for Ireland in two World Cups. That must have been pretty special to represent your family's heritage at two World Cups. Yeah, absolutely it was. Um, you know, I'm going to Ireland at the end of the year to see some family as well. Um, so it's a big part of who I am, um, and to represent Ireland is, um, yeah, it's a very proud moment. Probably one of the highlights of my career, to be honest. Um, playing two World Cups, you know, one in Australia, then one over in England. And we actually played Australia in Ireland, um, which was awesome. It was an yeah. awesome experience. A lot of my family from in Ireland, they, they come over to, to Limerick, uh, to Munster, and um, they watch the game. So that was great. Oh, nice. But uh, not only that, was the win over Samoa your international highlight? Because they had a wealth of... NRL experience in their team, and you scored three tries in that game. Yeah, that was awesome, to be honest. Yeah, Paramount Stadium as well, the old Paris Stadium. Yeah, um, yeah we had an awesome win against the Samoans, who, like you said, they had, they had all these NRL stars, and, you know, we just stuck together, and we had got an awesome win. Just a great experience with those boys, you know. It um, just means a lot to a lot of people, and, um, yeah, I love, I love my time playing for Ireland. Well, the Irish are ranked twelfth in the world, and I think they're in Pool C with New Zealand. How do you think they'll go? Is is the quarterfinal berth a goal? Do you think? Yeah, I think I think that in and around there is probably a decent goal for for those boys. Obviously, it's very hard to compete against the likes of, you know, like a lot of those a lot of those nations, Australia, New Zealand, you know, England, but even now Samoa Tonga. They're filled with, they've got 17 NRL players in their side getting that week in, week out, where a lot of the Irish guys, you might get a, a few playing in the NRL and then, you know, a few in the Super League, but then a few in the divisions below. So just the quality of talent. Um, but but doesn't mean that the boys can't try hard and that's that's what they base their game on is just working hard for each other and you never know what, what can happen. You mentioned there that you're heading over to... Uh, the World Cup, I think. Are, are you involved in the team at all? No, not not going for the World Cup. Um, I'm going over sort of a Christmas, oh, spend, okay. spending yep. some time around Wigan and then going to Ireland for Christmas. So, yeah, I'll have a Christmas in Ireland this year and then, um, yeah, take the family back and 
it's been about nine years since we lived over there, so I've still got a lot of friends there. Ah, oh, nice. 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 Well, we've got some common league questions brought to you by the Stubby Club. We can go to their website and type in Paraquet for a 10% discount off your purchases. Do you have a favourite game that you played during your career? And it doesn't have to be the games that we spoke about. It could be just a game that you thought, oh, gee, I just really love that game. Um, it's probably, yeah, I mean, it's pretty special. Probably the big ones, you know, like the grand finals. I was lucky enough to play an NRL grand final, two Super League grand finals, two Challenge Cup finals. Like the, the Challenge Cup finals played at Wembley, so that's a very special stadium. The grand finals are at Old Trafford. Um, so those big moments, you know, it's a te- like I said before, it's a team sport and to probably – Probably more you look back at the memories off the field as well, like after a good win on the bus ride home or in the sheds and being around the boys or it's just those special moments um, celebrating what, what you've achieved. You know, you only play regularly for a short period of your life. and When you look back, you don't think about too many things, probably probably more the memories you have. Yep. Maybe, maybe, maybe one game I look back on, which was a crazy game, we were playing Bradford in a semi-final and we were down 30 to 6 with 20 minutes to go. And um, we ended up coming back. So I was goal kicking then. I had to make sure that I got every goal as yeah. we as we scored. Um, so 20 minutes to go, we were chasing down. So we scored a try. We would go up to six. Um, so 30 to 12, then 30 to 18, 30 to 24, and then 30 all. And then I ended up hitting the field goal and we ended up winning the game. So that was, yeah, that was wow. a cra- cra- yeah. crazy win. Trent Barrett was in our side then for Wigan. And um, he was pulling the strings. He set up about three tries and... It was that was that was an amazing time. Um, the Wigan fans were going crazy. It's probably yeah, I couldn't believe we we ended up getting the win. Yeah, wow, unbelievable win. You, you mentioned there a couple of special stadiums, Wembley and, and Old Trafford. Um, other than your home ground, did you have a favourite ground that you used to love playing at? Can be in Australia or England. Um, yeah, sometimes you like playing at those old suburban grounds. There's a fair few of them over in England. Where they generate probably more noise, like like even at Leichhardt Oval, if you have if that's forward, you know, just say if it's fifteen, sixteen thousand at Leichhardt, I'd rather have that than thirty, thirty thousand at A and Z because yeah. there's not a lot of atmosphere at A and Z, you know, where those those grounds and everyone's huddled in close together, you can definitely feel it out there as a player, and it just creates to the atmosphere. Um, I think we realised how important fans are during when COVID and there was no fans at games. Yeah. It just didn't have the same feel to it. Um, so the fans are so important to to our game and, and creating that atmosphere for the players. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. Did you have a least favourite, one you hated playing at for whatever reason? Um, well, my last year we played over there, I think, I can't remember the ground it was at. We played it, might have been Halifax over there. There was a ground that had this incline. So in the second half, you were literally running uphill. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, in the first half, you're feeling you're feeling like you're 20 years old again, running downhill. Um, but then running uphill, it's not not so good. Yeah, no, that's that's a bit strange that one. Uh, <laughs> we see these days the Matt Burton bombs uh, that some wingers and fullbacks find hard to catch. But who would have been the hardest kick out of the catch a kick from when you played? Oh, I still remember one Friday night, I think, we played uh, Newcastle up in uh, Marathon Stadium back then. Um, Andrew Johns was there, and he's putting up these these massive bombs, and I remember just going, wow, where, where, where that, where's that going to land? Um, so guys like that would just hit it a mile. Um, yeah, Matt Burden, he's, he's a bit different. He's just he's hitting the ball so well at the moment. Um, I think that one he hit in Origin was the biggest bomb oh, I've ever seen. Yeah, no, it went above the roof line. It was massive. I wouldn't want to be standing under it, that's for sure. But uh, speaking of uh, kicking, your kickoffs, the long, high, hang time ones, who who taught you to do those? Because I could imagine they'd be pretty hard to catch as well. Yeah, they're tough to catch. Probably probably got a bit of inspiration from Andrew Johns. He used yeah. to try things off kickoffs. Um it was probably Graham Arnold, um, the Australian soccer coach. He was our kicking coach in 2005, where okay. he he just played around with a few things on the tee and got the ball to you know spiral a little bit. And you know, I got pretty long legs, so you put it all together, and you, you come out with um, big, high, ugly kick and really tough to catch. So I used to love when the when it was a windy day or if it's raining or whatever, yeah. it makes it a bit harder. Throw the ball up there in the elements and let that let it take over. So it's yeah, I always try to challenge um, 
challenge from my kickoffs and make it hard hard to catch. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, some of those kickoffs that you did, they were unbelievable. Uh, you played with and against some champion players during your career, but is there someone you would have loved to have had in your team or even play against during your career? Um, well, I was pretty pretty lucky to, to play against a fair few players. Um, you know, I played against Laurie Daly, you know, like played with Gary Larson. So there's that era all the way through to even these current guys now. It's... You know, playing there's so many great players in that Melbourne Storm side. You Billy Slater's, Cameron Smiths, Greg Inglis, and Cooper Cron, all the way through. Um, yeah, so I was lucky to play with some outstanding players. Uh, Auckland who... over there at Wigan, he was probably um, probably the best player I reckon I played with. He was he had it all. Um, he had an amazing career, and um, he would have been outstanding had he come to the NRL. Who was it that you were glad that you had in your team and not on the opposition? Someone that you felt that if they played, you were confident that you were going to win? Yeah, I suppose guys like who have a bit of that X factor, like Benji at his best, you know, James Tedesco, um, Sam Tompkins when I was at Wigan, Sean O'Loughlin, those sort of guys. Um, you just felt more comfortable knowing that they're consistent performers, so they rarely have a bad game. And then when it comes to it, you know, you can get something special out of them. So those sort of guys, that's why they get paid the big bucks, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Who did you find in your teams or the opposition was the biggest pest or sledger on the field? <laughs> um, yeah, there's a fair few sort of, um, <laughs> Jamie Lyon was a, was a, was a bit of a pest back then. Yeah. Um, he didn't mind having a sledge. Brett Finch used to, Used to love having a sledge, Fletch, those sort of guys. Yeah, it's a good can, part of the game. Can, can you remember any of the sledges at all? Uh, probably can't talk about them on the podcast. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> no that... it's um, it's more, it's more so just uh, having a crack at you know, just making people laugh out yeah. there. It's you know, it's not like cricket where you're going to try and get someone out. It's it doesn't really happen, but it's more, more a bit of banter out there, you know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what about uh, on the other side? What, who was a larrikin or, or prankster at club level, and what did they get up to? We had guys like you know when I was at the Tigers, you know um, Liam Fulton, Bryce Gibbs, Daniel Fitzhenry. Um, they were just pests nonstop. They used to pick Daniel Fitzhenry used to pick on Roycey Simmons, and um, you know he used to go and get the strapping tape and like go into his office and strap his phone and strap everything <laughs> like just to and Royce would come in and he, he couldn't use anything because it's all just you know stuck together or whatever. So it was just just things like that, you know. Ah, oh, you can't pick on Royce, surely. <laughs> <laughs> Royce, Royce gave it out as well. Don't worry. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Now uh, what did he get get up to? I oh, know a bit of banter. He loved it. Yeah. Um, he was a great. He was a great guy to have in our in our team. He was a big part of our 05 sort of success as our assistant coach. Yeah, definitely champion bloke. Doing it a bit tough at the moment. So I wish all the best to Roycey. Um, Tigers and Panthers played for the Royce Simmons Cup yesterday, so that was a nice touch. Yeah, I was uh, I was in there yesterday and I was talking to Roycey and um, he's doing he's doing really well. Um, it's quite amazing. He's he's actually raised um, about a million dollars so far. Yeah, wow. To uh, to that from that little walk that he started, and, um, you know, like something happened bad to him, and he's the type of guy that he, he turns it around into a positive. He's yeah. made all this money, and you know, hopefully, hopefully, something good can come of it, and they can they can raise awareness, and they can put it in the right areas. Yeah, definitely, champion bloke doing champion things. What would Pat Richards' nickname be, and who gave it to you? Um, oh, when I didn't really have one to be honest. Okay. It was more like more Patty. Yeah, they used to call me Patty, um, Richo, things like that. When I was at the Tigers, Aaron Woods used to try and call me Ice Man. <laughs> I think because I, I, I did a kick once, and he's going, "That's it, you're the Ice Man," and trying to make it stick. So he still calls me Ice. Okay, um, yeah. But, I've never really had too many nicknames that have stuck. Nah, fair enough. Is there a player or players uh, that play today that you would love to have played against or that you'd love to play against? Um, maybe all of them now. I suppose since I've stopped playing now, now, now I've become a fan of the game and I, I just look at it and, and just you realise how the, where the game's at at the moment. You know, it's in a good spot. You've got some amazing kids out there. They've got some great skill. Like, you've got guys like Ryan Papenhaus and 
Tommy Turbo, like the things he was doing last year, I don't think I've ever seen anyone do. Um, incredible player. So it's the game's in a really good spot. Um, these kids are they're amazing at what they're doing, and um, yeah, they're still making the game exciting, and they're taking it to the next level. Yeah, definitely. Did you have any uh, pre-game rituals, either the night before or in the sheds that you have? That, did you ever have any of those? I used to. I used to uh, make sure I had to put my left sock on first, right sock, and do all those sort of things. Okay. And, um, yeah. I remember having a chat to Tim Sheens one day, and he, he, he just snapped me out of it, to be honest. And, yeah. and ever since then, I never never worried about anything. He sort of just said, you know, that's like superstitions are for weak people because they, they need that to happen. So what if that doesn't happen? Um, and I thought about it. I thought, yeah, you're right. So actually, when I did my ankle in that preseason game, I, I had white boots on. And I was thinking, oh, I can't wear those white boots ever again. Can't yeah. wear them because that, that was the reason. But it wasn't. So I made sure my first game back, I wore those same boots. And okay. I just and I got through it. And then I was like, oh, see, it's, there's nothing to it. Yeah. So, so I sort of learnt, learnt that, and it was probably good to have it then, because then uh, after that, I didn't have any superstitions. If I felt like doing whatever, I just did it. Yeah, no, that's a nice way to look at it, definitely for sure. Did any teammates have a a weird superstition or ritual? In the yeah, some guys, some guys used to wear the same pair of undies, like they'd have holes in them, like by the end of the season, like it's just like ridiculous. Yeah. Um, some guys would get nervous. Some guys would spew before every game, and um, yeah, it was just. Yeah, some people. Would, it's it's just how you deal with your nerves, I suppose. That's it. Well, we'll wrap things up with the uh, segment that I call the set of six. It's basically sort of like the personality questions, a little bit away from rugby league. But uh, you've mentioned cricket. There is there another sport outside of rugby league and cricket that you enjoy watching or playing? Yeah, I'm loving the UFC at the moment. Okay, yep. Um, getting into that, um, loving all the fights. Um, it's always something different going on. It's, it's a great challenge. So, it's um, yeah, it's, it's awesome to see. There's a couple of good Aussies out there at the moment as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Alex Volkanovski just won the other day, uh, yeah, retained did. his championship, which is great to see. Uh, what's your specialty dish in the kitchen or on the barbecue? Um. I like to mix it up a little bit, but uh, probably probably a slow cooked meal is what yeah. I what I sort of do love. So a bit of uh, a bit of that, like a lamb shoulder, you know, a little casserole, throw it on in the morning, and then come back about eight ten hours later, and it's just outstanding. Oh, so perfect. probably probably something like that, or just a nice steak on the barbie. Yeah, no, perfect and a great idea at this time of year. Uh, nice winter meal. Uh, who is the most famous person you'd love to meet and have a chat with? Um, most famous person, probably Michael Jordan. Yeah, he's um he's pretty cool character. You know, he's he's probably the greatest athlete you know the world's ever seen. He's also you know he's created a, a shoe brand which is just incredible. And um yeah, you'd love to have a chat with him and have a game of golf with him. And just just yeah, it'd be awesome because I did love the Last Dance that documentary. Yep. Yeah, no, that was a great documentary, and I reckon if I ran a poll of um, uh, guests when I asked that question, I reckon Michael Jordan would probably rate about 90% of, of votes, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, he gets mentioned a lot. Uh, if you were stuck on a deserted island, which three former teammates wouldn't you want to be stuck with and why? <laughs> um, I don't know, it's probably... <laughs> You probably got those three pests that I said, yeah. but, but also if you, if you get rid of them, it wouldn't be that fun either. Because uh, <laughs> you probably you probably want those three at the end. Um, but yeah, no, I, I didn't really have any dramas with any any of my teammates. So yeah. I got on well with all of them, and um, everyone's a bit different. But yeah, nah, I don't, don't know really how to answer that one. <laughs> no, nah, that, that that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Now, if you weren't a rugby league player and probably didn't go around down the cricket line, what? profession do you think you would would have taken up um i don't really know i probably wasn't great at school i didn't apply myself at school probably like i should have um so i don't know where I, where i would have ended up but you know it's, it's hard to say isn't it yeah i um yeah. i i'm just unfortunate enough that that i was able to do something that i loved and for so long and it just 
and took me to three different countries and took me all over the world and got to meet some great people and yeah so i'm pretty pretty fortunate uh, nice answer and the last one who was your favorite band or solo artist to listen to um that's that's a tough one it changes all the time really but i do like um yeah a fair few sort of artists um you know you got pearl jam and those sort of guys oasis um so yeah listen what, to a fair bit what's your favorite pearl jam song um stuff i'm probably better man yeah yeah no that's a good one well pat richards thank you very much for your time and your chat today here on the Paracave podcast i really appreciate it and enjoyed it i'm sure the fans will love it too um it's been great to chat with a player who i grew up watched play their career and play at the club i love in Parramatta. Um, i hope to catch up one day and have a beer and listen to more of your rugby league stories so pat richards thank you very much for your time and chat today on the Paracave podcast no worries, mate. Thanks for your time. All the best. This is Para, a place of gathering since time began, where salt water meets fresh, where our history meets the future. The centre of Sydney, the pride of the West, united by the blue and gold. This is Paradise. The 22 Eels season and memberships are now on sale. To find your place in paradise, head to paraeels.com.au today. Well, welcome back and thanks for listening to Pat and his rugby league story and what an interesting story it was and is. And as I said, I hope to catch up with Pat one day and say good day and listen to more of his rugby league stories. He's one of the most loved uh, players or ex-players in the game, still involved in the game today a little bit with the West Tigers. So we wish him all the best there as well. Once again, a quick shout out and thanks to Jack's Pale Ale, the fantastic major sponsor of this podcast for supporting the podcast. Now, to the competition the Leagues Club is running, uh, celebrating in conjunction with celebrating its birthday, you could win a new car, a Subaru Impreza. Uh, all you need to do is to check, check out the details at www.paraleagues.com.au on how you can enter and win that fantastic prize. Thanks also to co-sponsor Shannon Cooney from the Merrick Property Group. Contact Shannon for all your Penrith and Lower Blue Mountains real estate needs, either buying or selling, and also the Stubby Club. Thank you. And don't forget to head to that website, www.thestubbyclub.com.au, and order your NRL merchandise and also other codes, uh, merchandise as well. EPL, NFL, are just AFL are just another few to mention as well. Um, and you could use your Paracave discount code and get 10% off. Please support these businesses that support the podcast that help bring you quality entertainment each week. Share the love on socials as well. Love to see some uh, pictures of uh, maybe the products bought from the Stubby Club or having a Jack's Pale Ale at Parramatta Leagues Club or if indeed you do end up buying a house or selling your house through Shannon Cooney at the Merrick Property Group. That'd be great to see. And if you would like to become a sponsor of the podcast and get your business noticed a little each week, please feel free to send me a DM on socials or email the Paracave podcast at yahoo.com and we'll see what we can do for each other. Thank you once again to you, the listeners, for listening to Jim Sarantinos and his rugby league and life story. I really enjoyed listening to Jim's story. I hope you enjoyed it too, and if you missed it last Monday, simply head back to the episode list and check it out. It certainly was a little bit of a good insight into the Parramatta Eels, and I would love to do more interviews with players and also some of the team there at the Parramatta Eels. And speaking of the team, thank you again to the Eels media and communication team for allowing me the opportunity to interview Jim. It's most appreciated. Thank you to you, the listeners, for listening and sharing with your family and friends. And please, if you liked it, 
please give it a five-star rating and review on the podcast platform you listen to. I'd love to read some of the reviews. I'd love to see some of the five-star ratings come through. It really helps the podcast get noticed and reach more people, and it will be most appreciated. Also, if you like the Parramatta Eels or Rugby League in general, don't forget to tune in to the Talking Para podcast as well, another little podcast that I'm uh, involved in. It's usually out on Wednesdays for Para lads chewing the fat about the Eels each week. We review and preview the Eels games each week and also make a few predict- predictions as well as like the score, first try scorer and also a bold prediction. It's a bit of fun each week, so tune into that one. I'm sure this week's episode will be a cracker. And finally, you'll be able to catch myself on Pulse FM on the radio, 89.9 FM each Friday and Sunday, talking NRL with the Duckman himself on Duckman's Weekend Sports Wrap show. It's usually about 6.20pm each week, and you can also catch it on the iHeartRadio app. And also, thank thank you again to the official media partner of the podcast, the Parramatta Times. For all your local Parramatta news, simply head to www.parramattatimes.com.au and check out their digital edition. Stay safe wherever you are listening from in this world of ours. Have a great week as best you can, and I'll catch you next week for episode 106. But stay tuned to the socials to see who is coming up next. And once again, by all means, send me a DM on socials as well. Always up for a chat about the greatest game of all, Rugby League, and also the Parramatta Eels, or simply who you would like to see come on the show for a chat and we'll see if we can get them on and to sign off the show and as i always say the Paracave podcast by the fan for the fans go para